Good evening and uh, welcome to tonight's meeting. Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, glad that people are healthy and can tune in to tonight's meeting. We have a great uh, discussion for, uh, for you tonight around a really critical issue that affects tens of thousands of people here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I just wanna give you a, a little update before we start the meeting uh, about a couple of uh, key issues. One is uh, on where we are in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the county, as you may know, uh, uh, entered last week uh, the, the next uh, tier uh, in the state's blueprint for a safer economy. Uh, that means that our uh, new case rate and positivity rate and hospitalization rate are lower that they, we have moved from the widespread purple category to um, the substantial red category. It means that we're moving in the right direction. We still have a lot of work to do. To, uh, today, we have just over 2,100 cases. And uh, it's, uh, I regret to announce that we lost another person to this virus uh, today. It was a man in his 40s from South County um, who had other health issues, but COVID was the primary reason why he died. He died at home, he never came into the hospital. And so we continue to do uh, outreach, especially down in Watsonville. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with a collection of educators, elected officials, community-based organizations, do targeted messaging uh, to get more testing done uh, down there, uh, to offer information in linguistically appropriate ways. Uh, and we'll continue to work hard to slow the spread of the virus in Santa Cruz County. Uh, next week, I'm gonna have uh, with me the chancellor at UC Santa Cruz, Cindy Larvey, uh, who will be talking about our partnership with UCSC to greatly expand testing. It's a really exciting uh, opportunity that we have here, and it's wonderful that we have a university in our community that could really help us during our time of need. Uh, a couple other things I just want to share with you. Uh, now we're about four weeks uh, since the start of the August CZU August Complex fire. The, 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 the worst natural disaster the county has ever faced with uh, about 900 homes completely destroyed. Uh, I saw today that it ranks as the 10th most destructive fire in California history. Uh, we, we expect that by the end of the weekend that they'll have the fire fully contained, but they will be up there uh, until the rainy season starts, putting out small spot fires and just uh, making sure that we don't have any problems. Most everybody who has a home is back in their houses, but there's still about 2,000 people uh, who are out of their houses. Uh, we still have a shelter going on at uh, the fairgrounds and we have hundreds if not over a thousand people in hotels both here in Santa Cruz County as well as uh, in our surrounding counties. On Tuesday the Board of Supervisors took some action uh, to try to figure out ways to make it easier and faster for people to rebuild their homes. Um, we are bringing in uh, contract staff that can help process um, uh, applications within days rather than months. Uh, we are going to try to grandfather in uh, structures that may have been legal but non-conforming. Uh, we're generally going to be working with people if they uh, on, on this, a similar size structure, no greater than 10% uh, to, to come back to their locations. People will need uh, to, to look at their foundations. The, the strength of this fire was hot enough that it could have affected foundation. And the county is also gonna be working with the state regulations around septic tanks, which is a huge issue in, in these communities. Uh, this, the county is reducing the lot size required for septic tanks, but septic tanks will be required to be brought up to state standards. So that will be an issue. Uh, one of the other things that we talked about is geotechnical work and how we could do that more effectively and efficiently and try to help out as many people as possible so that doesn't become a problem. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of work in, that will be done and still needs to be done to make sure that people can rebuild as quickly as possible. Right now, people have been focused on the cleanup. Uh, the EPA is coming in to do the first round of cleanup of the most hazardous materials. Uh, either the Cal OES or private contractors will do the second round of cleanup. 
Um, and the staff uh, at the county is working very hard to make sure it's safe for people to return. One of the things that we know is going to be a challenge in just the coming months is what's going to happen when it starts raining. Due to the intense heat of this fire, the soil has changed in these neighborhoods and they will no longer be able to accept water in the same way. There's a, there's a, there's a biological process that takes place with this high heat. And so what we've seen in other communities that have been devastated by fires is that when the rain comes, we have to be concerned about debris flow. And so the county is working with geologists to map where those debris flows might be, uh, but it won't take much for that, those, the, that ground to start moving. They say it only takes a quarter inch in 15 minutes for, uh, for the ground to start moving. So we wanna make sure it's safe for people to go back um, and that may uh, result in some people not being able to stay on their property uh, until we can be sure that the debris flow won't be happening. Uh, the other thing which I will just share with you is we know that the fires are one of the examples of climate change and the extreme weather events, which we've heard about as one of the, the consequences of climate change, uh, is now very real in our communities because of the fires. The, the, the board also dealt with the other climate change impact that is real and is gonna affect our community is sea level rise. The news this week about the Antarctic ice shelf uh, cracking and melting um, means that it's very clear that the ocean levels are gonna rise. And our board has been working for two years to try to come up with a new set of policies in our local coastal program, um, uh, local coastal plan uh, to be able to meet uh, the uh, requirements of the California Coastal Commission um, and help protect uh, homes and infrastructure while maintaining coastal access. Uh, I've been working with uh, supervisors and city council members through the California State Association of Counties and the League of California Cities with the Coastal Commission uh, to try to look at strategies around sea level rise. I believe that the package that we voted on on Tuesday is the most far-reaching and innovative package uh, right now in the state of California. I hope to be in front of the Coastal Commission uh, within the coming months to be able to present the elements of our plan along with my colleagues from across the state in order to get buy-in from the Coastal Commission to look to, to make sure that they know there's not just one response to climate change and sea level rise. There's multiple responses and it should be tied to geology, science, voter-approved land use um, uh, patterns, and uh, critical uh, infrastructure. So uh, if, you, if you've been, been attending my meetings on a regular basis, you just two weeks ago you heard uh, from Dan Hayfley and Mark Massara and I presented a, a short slideshow about that, uh, but I'll be sharing more about that in the future. Tonight, we're gonna talk about a very important issue. Um, it's hard to believe that um, the, the city of Santa Cruz Water District is greater than the city of Santa Cruz. We don't usually think about that. But if you live in Live Oak, Carbonara, and even west uh, of Capit Capitola, you are in uh, the city of Santa Cruz Water District. And although we've been part of that district for close to 90 years, we pay extra because we're not city residents. Currently, we pay 14.5% more. But over the years, we've paid as much as 100% more. And just five years ago, we paid 27.5% more. These surcharges are uh, a relic of a different age. And uh, tonight uh, joining us is Linda Wolschusen. Linda is the only non-city resident who's part of the City uh, Water Commission, the advisory commission to the city council who act as the board uh, uh, for the water district. Uh, in her role, she has to represent all the needs of 30, over 35% of the ratepayers in the system. And uh, she has been, uh, she is formerly the executive director of the Regional Transportation Commission. She is a founder of Live Oak Neighbors and the Live Oak History Walk, and she was a founder of the Women's Health Center. So Linda is a doer, and uh, I'm really glad to be working on this issue with her. Uh, she put together a chapter for a recent Museum of Art and History's history journal about land use issues in, in Santa Cruz County, and in that, she talked about issues of Live Oak Incorporation and it touched on the water issue. And it was, it's pretty amazing when you look at the history of this. And I thought it was important to share with you tonight, uh, sort of that 
the, the, the twisted tail that makes up the Live Oaks participation in the city water district, how we've been charged this incredible surcharge and what we can do about it. So I wanna introduce Linda, thank her for being here, thank for all of the work that she's done. And uh, tell us, you know, when did we become part of the, the water district and why do we pay this surcharge? Thank you, John. And uh, I wanna say I really appreciate working with you on this issue. Uh, I moved to Live Oak from Santa Cruz in uh, 1988 and I've lived in the county since I came here in 1967 part of the third year at UCSC. And um, one thing I wanted to add to the background that is relevant to my interest in this topic is that in the late 1970s, I worked for the Santa Cruz City Attorney on the Kinsley lawsuit, and that had to do with the Irana Gulch Greenbelt. Sure. And I did research for them on why the Broadway Bromer Road across Irana Gulch was never built. So it was in the course of that research that I started coming across discussions about annexation because the road was very linked with annexation. And um, that interest after I retired from the Regional Transportation Commission um, uh, got me going in about 2015 on researching why Live Oak was never annexed to the city of Santa Cruz or Capitola for that matter. And then I published the article that, that you mentioned, which is called Between the Gulches, The Twin Fates of Live Oak Cityhood and the Broadway Bromer Road. And while I was reading the old news articles, I kept coming across discussions of um, city water rates in the same paragraph as discussions about annexations. And I included some of these examples in my memo or our memo, um, but I wanted to read a good example of what we found because it kind of um, hits all the all the points that we're that we're making with this. Now here's here's the article. This is I kind of org I organized them in a notebook when I when I am um, doing my research, and the title of this is um, "Outside Water Rate Hikes Suggested as Annex Annexation Spur." It's not very long. Mayor Bert Snyder said this morning he is going to ask the council to formulate an active program to encourage annexation to the city. And water commissioners have suggested spur increases in the rate differential for outside city users. A 15% differential now exists, like today. A boost to 25% was discussed at the commission meeting yesterday, but no action was taken. Robert Warren, a council liaison to the commission, expressed council interest in annexation, quote, if we are to achieve the greater Santa Cruz we need, instead of gradually being hemmed in by little communities. The chairman acknowledged the problem and affirmed the idea of using water service as an inducement. Then the biggest mistake the city made was to authorize extension of water service outside the city limits in the first place. Well, it happened. He justified the water differential on the basis of capital improvements being underwritten by residents. So this is, um, uh, another, this last statement is an example of what I, in, in the memo, we've called the myth um, that only city residents pay for uh, capital improvements in the water system. As a uh, Linda, fact, Linda, just one, one, if I can interrupt you for one no, second. Yeah, of course, so, interrupt me anytime. Just, just so I, I realize I should have said this at the beginning, you and I authored a memo to Rosemary Menard, the city water uh, uh, director, uh, in June with a long history and asking her to address these surcharges. And so that's the memo that you're referring to in, in case people didn't know. Right, and there's a link to that on, on in your newsletter um, if, if people need to look for it. And we, you know, it's, well, right now it's in the Water Commission packet also yeah, from that sure. meeting on Monday. So um, the the myth, which which I think have, have been questioned some, by some people is that um, only city ratepayers pay for, for, for capital improvements. And the big capital improvements that are now in the process of being rehabilitated because they're 60 years old are the Graham Hill Treatment Plant, the dam at Newell Creek and the Newell Creek Reservoir, as well as other uh, parts of our storage and distribution system. And those were financed in uh, 1958 by a revenue bond and by definition a revenue bond is paid by the ratepayers. 
So whenever new people came into the district, uh, either or moved into the city, either the, the city or the, the entire service area of the, of the city water department, um, they would, in their fees that they were paying, their, their, in their water fees, they would be paying off the loan that was made for these capital improvements. So, so that's why I've called this a myth, because I think that idea that only residents were paying for the, the water system kind of mm, got perpetuated with, within the city, and it was one rationale that was used to perpetuate the outside city surcharge. Um, over time, this idea that, that I read about, the idea that if, well, if you increase the water rates, people will want to annex, that kind of scare, carrot and stick approach um, uh, got complicated by UCSC, which was approved in the city in 1961 and then opened in 1965, if you can imagine anything happening that quickly now. And um, uh, also, 10 years later, it was complicated by capital of uh, annexing 41st Avenue. So during that time frame, which I talk about in a lot more detail in my uh, history article for the, for the museum, um, uh, the idea that um, higher water rates would get people to annex basically fell apart because annexation became um, not an option. And I think part of what happened also, um, another reason it became not an option is I think the city got used to the revenue from the surcharge, especially as the surcharge increased and as more people were moving into the unincorporated area. And, um, you know, it was harder to let go of that, of that revenue. And in Live Oak, the higher water fees actually made people more wary of the city, so less likely to want to annex. And I think, I think that, well, my opinion doesn't matter, but in, it, it was a detriment to both, to, to both communities, I think, in the long run. So um, speaking generally to the surcharge, it, it really seems to me, and I've talked about this at the, at the Water Commission meeting, and it's in our memo, that the surcharge no longer serves the city or all of its customers, any of its customers. And right now, because we're in the process of a, fi a new five-year rate setting, um, discussion, we have an opportunity to resolve the situation. I think most people who have Santa Cruz City water very much value that we can turn on our tap and have clean, um, reliable water service. And I can say um, I really appreciate that and I try and communicate that to, to the city staff and, and the you know, really dedicated employees who work in our water system. And as I mentioned, most of our water facilities are old. They're, well, they're a little younger than I am, but they're over 60 years old. And, you know, um, you need to rehabilitate and upgrade those kind of facilities uh, over time. And right now we're facing um, major challenges in doing these, this rehabilitation. And in fact, we've already started some improvements to the Loch Lomond um, Dam, well, the, the reservoir and the Newell Creek Dam. Um, I think that uh, even though it was pointed out during the meeting on Monday that um, if, if we pay less in our, in our area, then somebody has to pay more. I, that's true. Um, I think most people, and you know, I think with, both within Live Oak and also within the city of Santa Cruz, appreciate the equity concerns that we've outlined in our arguments. And um, I uh, noted also at the meeting that the, the commission itself, the, the Water Commission, has set um, equitable uh, and trans equitable access to water service as one of its highest priorities. And um, I think if we um, look at how we can do this uh, within really the early time frame of this rate setting process, we can get that issue off the table so we can face the difficult challenges of how are we gonna pay for all these improvements that are essential to our water system. And I didn't even mention water supply. That's kind of the, you know, the third one there. Um, and finally, the laws changed. The law changed about a decade ago. Um, well, two decades, uh, two, and a half, two and a half decades ago with, with Prop 218, but Prop 26 really refined um, the rules around utility rate setting and, um, uh, John 
you and I believe, and um, I think we have support from a number of our community leaders on this too so far, that um, we, we don't believe that this surcharge is legal any longer. It may have been fine in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but um, it doesn't uh, follow current rules and uh, our new water rate structure that we'll be working on, the city will be approving in, in the next couple of years um, needs to account for that. So I guess, you know, the, the background is something, somebody like me who likes to know how things work and what happened or why things happen. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, but uh, I think what's most relevant now are the requirements of state law and, and the, the goal of achieving equitability and um, transparency and how we set our water rates and apply them across the board. So. I'm ready to answer questions. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. And I want to tell people that if you'd like to ask a question to Linda about this, about our water rates, about the, the history, um, or about anything else that we've talked about here today, there's a Q&A button at the bottom and you can uh, just type in your question and we'll make sure to get to it. Um, uh, there's a couple things that I just want to say. First of all, uh, you referred to a meeting on Monday, the water- oh, sorry. The uh -huh. Water Commission um, meets regularly, and they're just at the beginning of this rate setting process. They had anticipated uh, that the, the rates would be set, uh, I think, uh, much sooner than they're actually going to be set. Uh, COVID and everything else that's gone on has pushed this rate setting process back, I think, to 2022. Um, it's, a, it's pushed it out a year. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Um, my ex my experience. So Monday was just uh, one of the earliest meetings that the um, that the water commission was going to start hearing about the rate setting package, and my experience uh, from five years ago uh, informs me that you got to start early in this process. I entered the process very late. I wasn't tracking the water commission five years ago, but I pushed on the city to make sure that they did a rate study to prove that they could, at that time they were charging us 27 and a half percent more for water. And that seemed patently unfair to me. Uh, I knew a little bit of the history and uh, they did do a rate study and they came back and they said, we can prove that we can charge you 14 and a half percent more. <clears throat> and I said, okay, well, I don't have the, at the time I didn't have the skill to be able to, uh, to analyze that study effectively to, to know, but I did make the case that if you could prove that you could charge us 14 and a half percent, we were paying almost double that for a long time. So couldn't we call the whole thing even and just get rid of it? And they said, legally we can charge it, so legally we're gonna do it. <clears throat> this time, we, uh, you and I in our conversation, we wanted to start at the earliest possible uh, moment, and that's why we sent the memo in June uh, we asked for a reply from uh, Rosemary Menard, the, the water director. Uh, she says that they're going to be doing a rate study. Um, I've talked with our attorneys at the county, and we believe that the last rate study was not a very great rate study. Um, and we are hoping they do, do a much more involved study this time. And we're hoping that we can get rid of uh, this surcharge completely. It doesn't mean that, um, that your rates will never go up. It means that we won't pay more than our fair share of, of the uh, improvements that are necessary for the system. So uh, that's why we're starting so early. Uh, there, the Water Commission wasn't making a decision on uh, Monday night, but it was. I was grateful to, that we had the support of about a half dozen community leaders, business people, um, uh, uh, former county staff, uh, arts leader, uh, someone who used to lead the land trust, a uh, health leader, uh, to sort of talk about uh, why this was important um, and why it was unfair uh, to the people who live outside the city. And it, it was interesting to hear the response. And I think that that this is going to be a debate um, uh, over the next couple, uh, over the next year, as they move through this process. They can fix it. They have the power to fix it. So uh, I'm going to go to the uh, some questions. Uh, that we received. Um, so this is from Michael and he says, uh, I pay for my water in my space rent as a group cost. Does the normal water invoice have a separate infrastructure cost with a separate water cost? 
And does that give them some incentive to save water? And so maybe, Alinda, you want to say, why don't people know that we pay 14.5% more for water? And, and, and why has it been such a mystery to people for so long? So, um, so the, the way that this is handled right now um, with the water department is that it's called a differential rate system. So there's, there are two different uh, rate schedules. There's one for the city, uh, city residents, and actually their bill goes out together with their, um, their wastewater, um, sure. their wastewater bill. And there's a second one for out, all outside city residents. So it's not just Live Oak. I mean, it includes like Brands of 40 and um, Carbonara and Ponce Tampo and, you know, some places over on the, um, on the west side of Santa Cruz, outside the city limits. So um, we have a, a different rate schedule. And that rate schedule is the same in terms of the fixed fees and the, um, the volume fees that are in there, but they have this surcharge added onto them right now of 14 and a half percent. So that's a difference. So if you looked at your bill, you wouldn't um, see a surcharge on there. Sure. And, and if people pay for it in their mobile homes uh, as part of their space rent, they're getting that 14 and a half percent bump just like everybody else. Right. So that's being distributed to all the, all the, the users within that one water meter. Great. Um, so Judy asks, is it possible to get rid of the surcharge in Live Oak without being annexed to the city? Um, oh, yes, it is. Yes, because um, the, the surcharge is really, uh, it's, it's approved by the city council as part of the rate structure. So in 2016, which, which um, Supervisor Leopold referred to, uh, we didn't, we didn't have, we, we knew there was a problem with this and it was, um, double what it is now essentially, but we didn't have the, the information that we have now about the history of it and um, we didn't have um, enough information to, to argue the legal case either. Yeah, and so just so people know, the, uh, Linda's article about uh, annexation and incorporation is fascinating. Uh, Live Oak is not going to is not attractive at this point to be annexed into anywhere else, um, and it's it doesn't have the resources uh, for uh, incorporating it as its own city. We don't have enough commercial space to pay for what you would see in, in normal city functions. So we're going to be an unincorporated community for uh, for a very long time, uh, and um, but we're in the city of Santa Cruz Water District sphere of influence. And, and that's uh, uh, something we use that every year. Uh, and, and LAFCO has to approve it every 10 years, actually. We, I just made sure that they did it about a year and a half ago. Um, it, she also asked, is there advantages to Live Oak being annexed besides the water issue? Would we, would we want to be annexed? Do you have an opinion about that? Do I have an opinion about that? Um, I, I would say, and you know, you can, you can take a look at my article. You, all you have to do is Google between the gulches and you should, you should be able to find it. But, um, I, uh, I, I think generally speaking that, um, urbanized areas are served best when they're part of a municipal government, which means a, a city government. So I have that, I'm a planner. I have that general opinion where that's one reason our situation is so unique really in a lot of ways because most places in California where you have an urbanized area that's as urbanized as everybody else around it um, and it's surrounded by two cities, it's, it's annexed to one, of, one of, or, or the other of the cities or they merge cities or something's happened. So there, were, there, was, there was like a decade of discussion about this in the 60s and 70s sure. and there were, you know, I mentioned UCSC and 41st Avenue as a part of that discussion, but there, the road the, the road across the gulch was part of that part of that um, complication of that situation, and there are a lot there are a number of different reasons why we we never did it, and it's it's hard to imagine how it would work out today. Not impossible, but hard to imagine. But you know, a lot of things are happening that are hard to imagine. So. <laughs> It's 2020, anything can happen. I, oh my well, God. Uh, and let me just, uh, just uh, I serve on our local LAFCO, which is the Local Agency Formation Commission, 
LAFCOs were established by uh, then Governor Pat Brown uh, through state legislation in 1963, as California had gone through an incredible growth spurt after uh, World War II. And we started seeing large evidence of urban sprawl throughout California. And he had the vision that you needed to have uh, a, a local uh, commission that could help with the orderly um, provision of services, work to prevent urban sprawl, and protect prime ag land. That sounds very much in keeping with who we are as a community. Um, but uh, when LAFCO reviewed the application for the city of Capitola to take 41st Avenue, recognizing that that was going to be a major commercial opportunity for them, it would have been wise for uh, LAFCO at that point to take that require um, capital to take on parts of Live Oak um, and put them into city services. And you know, if you look at the line for Capitola and Live Oak, it's not a straight line. Uh, I've always said that uh, every every twist and turn in that probably has a story about why that property was in or out. Um, it makes a uh, little sense. And as someone who lives on Gross Road behind the mall, where the beginning and end of my roads are in Capitola, but I'm in Live Oak. Uh, it's it's part of the inconsistencies, and um, these days at LAFCO, we would probably do a much better job in making sure that people took on their responsibilities, and it's unfortunate that it was a missed opportunity back in 1970-something when they uh, annexed the uh, uh, 41st 70, Avenue. 75, 76. 75, yeah. 75, 76. And, um, and so these days, uh, just in the last couple of years, uh, the state has taken away many different uh, supports for incorporated new cities. And so it's unlikely that in most of California, you're going to see new cities incorporated until uh, some of these uh, support from the vehicle license fee and some other pieces that were taken away during the tough budget years, um, that it's really hard for a city to actually get started in California right now. I want to remind people that if you want to ask a question, you can just write it in the Q&A section. We'll be happy to answer it. Uh, Joanna uh, asked, uh, how do we get equal rates for everyone in, in this water family? Should we raise money to sue uh, based on the questionable legality of the surcharge? Um, I'm not sure whether you want to answer that or you want, want me to take it, uh, Linda. Well, um, I, I guess I would say, I would say, and you, you, hopefully you would say the same thing, John, um, that Right now, we're not even thinking about uh, any kind of uh, suing or a suit or a legal action or anything like that. We, we, don't, we, we don't think that's necessary at this time. There is a very deliberative process going on uh, over at the city with the, the water department and uh, the water commission. And I've been on this commission for seven years, actually almost, almost eight years. Actually, my term will be up um, in January. And I have a lot of confidence that when the facts are presented and, you know, good data is developed and presented that um, the city will make the right decision. I, I, I agree with all those statements, but I will also share that we have talked to attorneys to understand Prop 218, Prop 26, um, what is, uh, what our legal rights are, what the kind of questions uh, the city is going to have to answer in, in their next rate study. Um, I think that the case was made very clearly on Monday night from community leaders about the, uh, the, the unfairness of this and the, and the time to make the change. Um, and um, I, I remain hopeful and will remain optimistic that uh, the city will, will take that responsibility seriously and we can end this, uh, this inequity. Um, and if they don't, we will, we will look for whatever means possible uh, to make that happen because uh, th there are tens of thousands of homes who are paying this charge, have been paying this charge, and uh, shouldn't have to pay this charge. And it's, it's literally millions and millions of dollars that we've paid for the system. And so um, let's take care of this. Let's, take, let, let, let's make it work. Um, the, uh, we got another question from Michael. Um, not so much related to water. It's about walkable areas in Live Oak. It's hoping that the new CVS on SoCal has a cafe or diner. So let me just uh, share with people what's going on there. Um, there's a spot across the street from Dominican Hospital 
that was a weird collection of old buildings that were torn down now a couple years ago. It's still a weird collection of buildings over there. Decor and there, furniture. What, the, what was it? De decor furniture. Decor <laughs> furniture. You can use that interchange like I do. You kind of you kind of see it there all the time. That's where. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, there was a proposal brought to uh, the zoning administrator uh, at a meeting a couple weeks ago uh, to approve a CVS pharmacy. Now it seems uh, a great idea to have a pharmacy across the street from the hospital that would have a 24 hour pharmacy so people, no matter what time they were getting out of the hospital, could get their prescriptions filled. Uh, and it seems like a good use of space uh, and a good location uh, for that. So I expect that you'll start seeing that under construction next year. I can't recall off the top of my head whether it has a cafe as part of it. Uh, you know, the world has changed so much in just the last six months in terms of what we want, what we need, what people are willing to provide, uh, that we've started to see lots of projects change. We saw that change um, um, on the corner of SoCal and 41st, where they decided not to put a car dealership. And we've just made a decision on Tuesday to end our exclusive negotiating agreement with uh, Swenson uh, Builders uh, about the 7th and Bromer site where we had previously had community meetings and they were moving towards a small hotel and uh, 48 units of housing, a youth hostel, a small restaurant and market. Um, Post-COVID, those what people are financing and what people are interested in are really changed. And so we're looking at new uh, ideas there. We'll be having another public process, probably starting, I, don't, I think probably after the first of the year about what we're gonna do with that site. Uh, but I think you'll see more housing, a bigger park. You might still see a restaurant or market or, and, uh, and that youth hostel, but you won't see a hotel there. I think that that, that part of the project is, is really dead. And so what will happen with the CVS and, and all these other projects remains to be seen. Uh, I think it really will depend on how long uh, COVID goes on and, uh, and what kind of resources people have at the end of uh, the end of the crisis. Linda, I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things that uh, I think that uh, uh, you referenced, but people may not know is the lack of representation. So uh, non-city residents make up um, uh, over 35% of the ratepayers for the system, what kind of representation do we have? Well, as, as uh, anybody knows who has tried to figure out why they have a Santa Cruz address um, and they have city water, but they can't vote for the city council, <laughs> we, we um, and, and actually I addressed that in my article too, but because um, you know the, it has to do with how they assign zip codes and the timing of that. Um, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. We were talking about representation <clears throat> on oh, the- uh, Right, right. So obviously we can't vote for the city council. Um, uh, when the rates were double in the late 1970s, so that meant we paid twice as much as the people in the city. There was a, there was a suit at that time and it was, it was put, by, uh, put on by a, a group called Double Rates of Oppressed People, and the county eventually joined that suit. And at the um, end of that, which was a negotiated settlement, um, and it did, did ended up not being a trial in court, um, they reduced, the city reduced the outside rate to 58%, and, and they um, allowed there to be one representative from the outside city on the city water commission. And so that's the seat that I hold right now. Um, clearly with the percent of the, the rate payers, I think, I think it would be more equitable if we had uh, one of the other seats. Um, I'm not gonna take on that, that fight right now, but um, that's our, I am, I am that representation right now. And, you know, obviously we have our supervisor and we have, you know, other citizens who can speak at city council meetings and also at water commission meetings as members of the public. But in terms of representation, we have one seat on the water commission. Yeah, and this is one of the, one of the inequities in, in my opinion of, uh, about it, that we make up over a third of the system and uh, we have one member on an advisory committee um, uh, about water and it's such a critical uh, resource. 
I know that I've looked for ways in my years as supervisors to make it happen when the, the city had a proposal to extend water service to uh, the university. I looked for a way if there was ways to get uh, seats on the water board as, as a condition of that, because mm -hmm. that's one of the priorities of LAFCO is that, that you have representation of the system. We couldn't find a legal uh, way to do that. Um, and I would just point out that at the county, we have a number of boards where the board of supervisors are on the board, but we bring in other people. So we have a, a drainage district in which we have members of the Capitola City Council join us at the dais. They get to, to serve on there. We have a Pyro River Levy um, uh, 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 group called Zone 7 uh, that is working to build a levee along the Pyro River uh, to protect against flood. It's been going on for 25 years. Um, we have both uh, members of the Watsonville City Councils and members of the Pyro community. They sit on the board with us and the city could have the same kind of, you know, when they're taking up water issues, they could have two or three members of those outside join them on the dais or, or somewhere close and be part of the decision making so we had representation. Uh, it's hard to get people who don't have to give us representation to give us representation, uh, but it's, it's one of the things I think is important, especially when it comes to a critical resource. Uh, we got a question from jo, uh, Joanna uh, about a link to Linda's article for us to access and read later. I would say if you get my newsletter, um, uh, you, you, there is a link in the newsletter and if people don't get my newsletter, you can send me an email. Uh, you can uh, text Leopold to 22828, and you'll be able to sign up to be on the, on the email list, uh, and we'll be able to send you the newsletter. Um, if you send me an email, I'll send you a copy of it. And, uh, and I strongly encourage you to seek out the, the Museum of Art and History History Journal that looked at land use issues because it's a fascinating read. Linda's article is great. There are, I think, four other sort of case studies or, or um, examples of fascinating land use uh, battles here in uh, Santa Cruz. And it helps explain who we are and why we are the way we are. Uh, and I, I recommend that you seek it out because um, you'll learn a lot about our community uh, from reading those pieces. So, so the name, I could just say that the name of the journal is Landscapes, Activism That Shaped Santa Cruz County, 1955 to 2005. So a lot of it's about the, the, time, uh, the time period that I've been talking about, the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I found fascinating in your memo was uh, just the clear awareness from city officials about the inequity or the, the, uh, the basic unfairness. Uh, uh, when I was at the Water Commission meeting on Monday or participating in the Water Commission, there was a quote uh, from the water director 50 years ago, 50 years ago, um, that, that, the, that the Water Commission should come up with uh, recommendations for uh, rates that didn't have just a flat rate uh, to everybody who lived outside the city because it's supposed to be proportional. So they knew 50 years ago that, that that should happen. It doesn't make sense that someone who, um, someone who lives in Seabright and someone who lives on Eden in Live Oak, there's a, there's a 14 and a half percent difference. That the, the, the additional cost of getting it across the Murray Street Bridge can't be that much. Um, and uh, there's lots of other places that fall into that category. And one could argue that if someone's trying to get uh, water to 30th Avenue or Western Drive, is there really any difference in getting the water uh, to either one of those places? So um, it would be great to have a, a rate system that, that actually reflected the cost rather than just um, uh, sticking it to the folks who live outside the city. Uh, there's another question here that says uh, that someone, that Michael is suggesting annexation might be a positive way to go. Uh, we, we could still speak at city meetings to help advocate we are so close to Santa Cruz and Capitola that those decisions that affect Live Oak, uh, and he, he commiserates that uh, there's too bad we don't have enough revenue uh, to uh, incorporate Live Oak. So um, that's a choice that people could make uh, about uh, whether to advocate for annexation. The, 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 the way the tax system works 
is residential properties in some ways don't pay for themselves. We as homeowners or renters, we require a lot of services, but we don't generate a lot of taxes no matter what your property taxes are. And so um, as, as cities uh, uh, expand, they look for things that they can, um, that they can generate revenue that pay for all the services that all the people who live there require. So and unless we uh, come up with a great little factory uh, or business that, uh, that they can take over, I think it's uh, probably unlikely that we'll see that kind of um, uh, uh, annexation attempt anytime soon. Uh, Linda, I wonder if you could uh, just uh, say uh, a little bit more about um, uh, that, that incorporation effort back in the 70s. You know, what it is that uh, people were trying to do? Who were some of the people involved? So it's, <clears throat> it's interesting that you mentioned um, Seventh and Bromer because the owner of that, uh, the farm there, which was um, Emilio Majolo and his family uh, were, were a part of the uh, incorporation discussion in Live Oak. He was actually the president of the Live Oak School Board and the Live Oak Community Association at that, or excuse me, Live Oak Improvement Association at that time. So they were, you know, the people involved in wanting to incorporate Live Oak, which means setting up Live Oak as its own city, were, were, were um, community activists within, within the Live Oak community. A lot of them had been involved um, with the school district, which is kind of a central focal, focal community uh, resource in, in Live Oak. Um, but not, not exclusively. Um, the analysis that I review in my article, and I'll just do an aside that um, you can access my history article about live oak annexation via my blog, which is everydayprimate.org. That's the name of my blog. So it's, it's in there. Uh, there's a link to it in there. Um, but uh, the, the process around LAFCO and all, all the discussions that were going on in the, in the 60s and 70s um, looked at the option of incorporation. It looked at the option of, of annexing to Capitola, which at one point was buying for Live Oak because you know, they wanted 41st Avenue. And let me make a comment about 41st Avenue is um, the reason that was so desirable is that the the freeway, which was fairly new at that time, um, you know, that segment of the freeway uh, was built in, it was opened in 1959. So, um, or actually that was a segment of high, from Morrissey to, to the Highway 1 and 17 interchange. So it was opened in 1949, but it, it basically went through farmland and the interchange of 41st Avenue, you know, nobody, people were thinking like, well, what the heck are you gonna do with, Who's going to use that interchange? Nobody's out there. And actually, it was the Owl family that first built um, their regional shopping center, which is at Capitol Road and, and 41st Avenue. This was before the mall. And that's when the light bulb started going off with both, Cap both Capitol and Santa Cruz and the, and the, the, the commercial interest there um, and reasonably are thinking that's going to be the next commercial center. So they both wanted to, to annex there. And um, there were meetings at Live Oak where there was you know, competing proposals from Capitola and from the city of Santa Cruz. And then here in the middle were the people in Live Oak who had suffered under high water rates and um, had very um, poor infrastructure here because the county at that time wasn't set up to provide municipal services. So they didn't have, you know, drainage facilities. They barely had, they had, had some sewer systems, no sidewalks, you know, the roads were pretty basic. So um, they, they had an opinion too. And there were actually UCSC the, in the early years when it was involved in a, in a, in a study about, about annexation and incorporation. So this discussion went on for a long time. LAFCO was, was a key part of it and, um, I tell all in, 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 in that history article. And it was fascinating for me to research this uh, and, uh, because, you know, nothing's simple, right? Nothing, right. There, everything has, is more complicated than you think. And that, that was basically what I came up with. There's no single reason why these things happen. It's just, you know, the university is very key. 41st Avenue is very key.
And the water rates are key. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, we talk about equity a lot in these discussions, and, and uh, one of the points that I made uh, on Monday night was that if you look at Carbonara and Live Oak, there are places of real wealth, um, but there are also places of um, work, lots of working families and pockets of real poverty. We know that the uh, Live Oak School District is a majority minority district uh, where there are more students of color than, there, uh, than anything else. And that a school like Live Oak Elementary, I think is 65% Latinx and 85% of the kids are on free or reduced lunch. So when you pay that extra 14.5%, it might hurt some of us differently, but it, uh, we also have a lot of uh, seniors because we have so many mobile home parks. And so the impact of that, of that extra surcharge hits the people who could afford it the least. And that's why it's important to, to adjust this, not just because it's unfair, but it really is inequitable and affects the, the as, we, as we're in this era of wanting to deal with the structural inequities that are in our system, we, have to, we should look here in our own backyard about uh, fixing these inequities. And I want to remind- I, I think that's one reason why the Water Commission has that as such a high priority in this rate setting process, equity and transparency. Um, because we, we are going to all be have to pay more to improve these you know, very important um, water systems that we have so we can have, you know, continue to enjoy having water clean, and clean water coming out of our tap. Um, so you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good fight and it has to be data-based and it has to follow the law. And the earlier we can make a decision, the better for everybody. Yeah, and so I, I want to encourage people as they as they pay their water bills, as they see city council members, uh, they can contact the water district to let them know that we want to that, that it's time to to take a look at this. Um, I'll be putting more information in my newsletter uh, to share information about where, when, and where it would be good to show up and and provide testimony uh, to the water commission and then maybe eventually the the city council if it gets all the way there. Uh, I don't want to remind people that next week I'm going to have uh, Chancellor Cindy Lavery. Lavery, is that how you pronounce it, Linda? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know. She, she insists that we call her Cindy. So uh, the <laughs> Chancellor of UC Santa Cruz will be joining me to talk about uh, the testing partnership that we have uh, with the university and how that's helping us expand our testing and meet the needs in our community. And then the following week, it's a special uh, meeting. I'll be joined by my colleague, Supervisor Zach Friend, and we'll have two fire chiefs, the Central Fire Chief and the Aptos La Selva Fire Chief, to talk about an interesting LAFCO issue, but a, a, a real impact on our public safety, uh, which is the consolidation of two fire districts, Central Fire District, Aptos La Selva, to become the largest fire district in, in the county and basically represent all of Mid-County. So I encourage people to, to tune in for that. Um, Linda, this year we couldn't do a lot of uh, history walks, but uh, is there yeah. is there uh, um, any uh, Live Oak history items that are coming up that we should uh, think about or participate in? You know, um, Norman Poitivan, who I who I um, neglected to mention, and who's our leader on the history walks. I know I know a number of you probably have been on the walks or or know him. Uh, has a book that's a compilation of the history walks as well as a number of other pieces about live oak history and it's um he prints it himself he's a book binder and um i, I actually facilitate um him getting his books out there so that's a wonderful resource and people can do their own walks and once the library is open again we have the brochures at the library um uh we you know COVID is has made it difficult for everybody and um We'll just have to wait and see what the future of the walks is. But in the meantime, the book is available um, through me, and I can give you the information for that. I, I even deliver the books to you. And well, on that is, that's, that's a live ochre right <laughs> hopefully there. I can, well, hopefully I can do it on a walk that I take, but if not, I, you know, I, I actually use my car. Um, and uh, uh, Norman's a great resource. Uh, he does a lot of presentations also, by the way, to different groups. So um, he's, he's, and I can provide his contact information to you. Yeah, and, and I hope to have, 
I, I hope to have Norman on the uh, uh, again. Oh, that'd be good. Uh, his uh, his uh, live oak history talk that we did in August was incredibly popular. We had some technical issues, and I know that Linda, you've helped us uh, uh, rectify that. Oh, and, uh, right, and, right. Uh, yeah. We're gonna we're he gonna have knows. Norman on again. He, uh, he now well, is is more savvy on Zoom. Yes, I. I well, yeah. that's uh, one of the benefits of the uh, pandemic is we're all getting a little bit better at using this technology. So we'll have Norman back on to uh, to to walk us through a, a bit of Live Oak history if we can't actually walk together in Live Oak. So yes. I want to thank you, Linda, for all you. that you've contributed to our community, your advocacy. You're an amazing partner in this fight uh, 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 to uh, rid us of this surcharge and, and you're a great representative of our community on the Water Commission. I feel well represented there. So thank you for that work. Uh, join us next week, six o'clock for the Chancellor. We'll find out how to pronounce her name and uh, we'll learn about uh, testing. So everybody stay healthy out there, watch it with the air and, uh, and wear your mask, wash your hands and stay six feet away from someone who doesn't live in your house. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>